So what I thought we'd do is I'll take some questions if that's okay. Okay, who wants to go first? We have a mic there. Yeah. So thank you very much. I think it was a wonderful talk. Not a moment went wasted. Thank you. Um, and a lot of it one can relate to in terms of not being religious but yet being spiritual. And or many of the things that you said, I think a lot of us could relate to. One question, you know, there's a lot of information and there's a lot of biology and science to what you've said, which is all very intellectual. You have to think about it. But we live in a, in a certain structure where we all have stressful lives and we have jobs and we have homes and families and we balance a million things and do a juggling act. Now, in that landscape, how does one incorporate this? If one wants to get to any of this, how does one begin in the madness of our lives? One, of course, simple thing is you take some time out and you begin spending a certain amount of time, half an hour a day. But how does one start? What do you start with? The first thing of anything like this is to start with a thought. Okay, let's assume this. You have to have a thought first, yeah. a, desi a desire. Then what? A desire. A desire is the beginning. There's a famous Zen koan I like. It says that try and meditate 20 minutes a day. And if you're really busy, meditate for an hour a day. You know? <laughs> so the, the, the thing to remember is that we are animals who like feedback. We like to get feedback and experiences so that we can actually return to where we tasted something. Right? If I meditate for two weeks and nothing happens and I'm looking at my watch and I'm counting, I'm not going to do it, right? right? I'm not going to do it. So I think that first and foremost, when I said think about it, I meant that you have to have an imagination about it. Right? We are mana, we are men of mind. We want to think about imagination of our things. We are people who imagine. We, we are not animals. We don't live in the here and now. We imagine. We imagine what here and now is. We don't even have, know what here and now is, right? <laughs> we don't know. We imagine it, right? And, and I think that if you begin with a simple idea of imagining what you want to have, right? Then start with something you've learned or learn something and practice it every day until you get an experience, start getting experiences. But don't do it in a haphazard way, you know? Start with one thing. Do a pranayam, you know. Do a mantra, you know. Go and meet a teacher and get a teaching. You know, learn something and do it, do it. But keep that imagination going. That, oh, I am that third eye. I am that mind. I am this heart. I am this body. I can see it coming together. I can see it climbing up. I can feel this energy, right? The more I do that, the more I can awaken, you know. As far as timing is concerned, there's no rule to it. And you, everybody knows that you can't meditate by time. You know, you can't meditate by time. You have to meditate by that intention, that feeling, you know, of I'm here and now, let me meditate. Even if I meditate while I'm cutting something, while I'm being somewhere, you know. So a meditation means to take away that chattering mind to a point where I'm awakening this inner beautiful system I have in me, right? And let it slowly, slowly awaken. It'll come. It'll come. I think you have to do it slowly, and you need a teacher or a guide or take some classes or go and see, a, you know, if you, can't, if you don't like gurus, go and do it on your own, right? But get a teacher, get a good guide, get a video, learn simple basic techniques of meditation, choose one school, do it well, right? And then explore, you know. But remember one thing, that meditation is not the end goal. Meditation is the process to get to that end goal. Thank you. This was a wonderful talk. I've uh, been doing a lot of reading already. I try and meditate uh, to reach this end goal. Uh, in spite of that, there were so many things that blew my mind today. So thank, thank you. you for that. Uh, my question is that there are, uh, like you said, several schools of thought about reaching this uh, place of bliss. In Kundalini, it's about raising your energy, whereas in Tantra, it's about uh, you know the union. So. A lot of people have been talking about one is better than the other. So what I wanted to understand is that, of course, there are five different schools and there might be hundred different ways of reaching this, but what is it that, you know, where does the dichotomy of all these thoughts come together 
and is it different for each individual or is it only different for uh, you know for each school and and is there a utopian you know <laughs> path to me it's been a, a, a voyage of discovery and exploration you know um, you make mistakes you do make mistakes <laughs> you know you will make mistakes but i think that that more importantly is let's let's think of the words of krishnamurti right krishnamurti said that any teacher who teaches you a technique and says this is the way right is pointing at his own experience and saying this is the way i found right now follow my path and you will get there right now the problem with that is that is it your path right and when do you ask the question so he says don't even go down any path he says ask the question what is meditation what am i doing right what is this body what is this heart what is the best state i can imagine of meditation you know what is this blissful state going to feel like going to look like you know it it your your questioning then if somebody comes along and says oh if you breathe with your little nostril like this and do this this and something will happen then you kind of have a questioning mind right you have a questioning mind some experiments you will try and you must try because they'll draw you to them and you have to decide what is to draw you right don't be scared if tantra itself has hundreds of schools right and you know like for example there's shri vidya there's uh, sexo yogic tantra there's all kinds of tantra right you've got to be careful a that finding a teacher that doesn't take advantage of you you know you know if you go to a class and they say okay you know it's going to take 7 weeks of doing this before i let you into this you know they, they, what, i don't know you know it's there's something and you feel uncomfortable with that walk away you know don't buy into it you know don't spend 10000 rupees to sit in front row next to the guru you know choose carefully choose these things carefully so i would suggest to you that knowledge and experience have to go hand in hand right you will make some mistakes on the experience right it's okay it's okay but as long as you're rising upwards the chances of you falling down and having a catastrophe are less right so you have to just choose carefully and thank you uh, i would like to know a little bit about uh, the role of mesencephalin in this process say it again what the word mesencephalin the 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 neuroanatomical term of uh, i would say the midbrain what they call it oh, simple okay so i would like to know the, a little bit the about limbic, that the limbic the limbic yeah yeah, yeah. How, limbic. how what's what's the role of that organ in in this process can, can you elaborate on that thank you very much the limbic region controls our emotions and that means that everything that most of the things you see wrong in your life or right in your life are a product of that region of the brain right the neocortex analyzes them and the frontal lobe gives you tells you instructions what to do and the the parietal lobe here interferes with telling the body what to do so you have this whole system going on right and i think that what this type of meditation or this type of technique asks you to do is to lower the impact of those two higher brains completely and come back to your reptilian brain as the starting point to look upwards right So what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the activity of the neocortex first, right? Decreasing limbic also. That means th- when they talk about witness and observer, right? What they're asking you to do is to be limbic, control your limbic. Don't react. Don't express anger. Don't get emotionally attached, right? You're controlling that, right? So the more we are able to train the lizard, the reptilian in us, right? it's like a place we go back to and from where we start right and that reptilian is also responsible for us running you know fleeing reproducing all that comes from the reptilian right our animal instincts right so we're saying we want to control our animal instinct we want to be at that threshold we want to understand our emotion and then we want to apply our brain to it with intention so the buddhists call it vipassana and samatha right which is the idea of stilling the mind calm down and then with intention throwing that pebble in right so you want to learn how to still first before you can throw the pebble in does that make sense a little bit yeah in 
various images, the location of the third eye on the forehead has been shown at different places. It's not at just one place. And you meditate on the forehead while well as the pineal is in the center of the head. You don't actually meditate on the forehead, but yes, carry on. Yeah, well, well no, you, you, may, you may tell us how to, yeah. whether, you, whether you meditate inside or outside. When you look at, are you looking from inside out? Or you are looking from where are you looking? <laughs> this, this, this is one question. <laughs> Good question. Because Osho answered that very well. And also yeah. one thing, what is the relation of Bindu with the third eye? Bindu is the top crown shashara, okay? Really speaking, right? In, kun, in Tantra, the Bindu is the top of the Sri Chakra. Right? Three-dimensional Sri Chakra is the Bindu, right there. Right there, right? What does Bindu mean? Bindu means the point Hrim and Shrim come and go, right, is Bindu. The place where expansion and dissolution occurs. <laughs> universe comes into being, universe goes out of being. That's the Bindu, right, right there. Right there. And this point is the Bindu, the Sahasrara, this point. If you look at the Sri Chakra Mandala, you'll see that Mount Meru, the tip, the top is called Bindu, right? This has now also become the Bindu, Bindi, right? Because it's the third eye which opens that, I guess. But it's know. all controlled by thought. My argument is that how enlightened are the artists that drew all these paintings? It's a good question, you know, because we have to understand that we are, we are stuck with the visual metaphors of people who may have given us something without any experience of it, right? So the gurus may have said, no, 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 draw it like this and draw it like that and that helps, right? Or this teacher looks like this and this like that. I think these are all metaphors, okay? These are all metaphors. If you want to look for the third eye, it's not an eye. It is a place in the brain which seems to have eye-like qualities, but it's actually much more than that. It's the whole system around it, you know? How the spine sends up energy, how it opens, how it deals with the rest of the, the whole area in that region, right? the hippocampus, all of that, how it goes there. I think we're beginning to understand that more and more. And as I explore it more, I will come back to you with more ideas. <laughs> Can we call it consciousness? Okay, let us look at consciousness for a second, okay? Let's look at consciousness. Right now, I'm conscious of somebody coughing over there, right? I'm conscious of your face right now, right? While I'm looking at your face, am I able to look at her face, right? I can't, right? I can't. Now, I've shifted my consciousness. Does that mean that you don't exist anymore? To you, you exist, right? But to me, maybe you don't exist anymore. Now, maybe only me and her. There's no other universe. Everything gone, blurred out. Now, you exist. You know, that you exist, right? So consciousness is actually scientifically proven to be one, like a film, one thought at a time. We can't think of multiple things. Yeah, it could be microseconds, but they're one at a time. Two, 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 two. Now what stilling the neocortex does is it allows you to kind of, of evade space-time and say, I am the observer watching myself looking at her. Yes? So, what we're training to do is we're training to do that. Which is that we first learn to observe ourselves being and then we introduce an intention. This is what we try to do. Thank you very much. It was great knowledge shared today from you. I wanted to know about the pineal gland. You were talking about the calcification which was beautifully shown. Now, in modern medicine, we uh, hear and we also experience there are a lot of ways of decalcifying the heart, the bones, and the brain with meditation. Is there a way we can do it with medicine, decalcify the pineal gland? Yes. There, um, there, there are foods you can eat. There are, you have to reduce fluoride in your diet. There are different things, four or five things you can do, right, mm -hmm. that decalcify the pineal. Can you give uh, us a little um, detail, please? The, the yogic way is, is sometimes called the Jyoti Mudra or a different mudra where you hold your eyes and you, you breathe into your stomach while holding your eyes and you look up. And that close all your organs, you know, um, 
uh, Yogananda taught it, Shri Chan Chinmoy taught it, a lot of yogis taught it, which is a way of just, you know, I'll show you. And this is not the usual nadi, not that one. It is this one. Now, by looking up there, that begins the process of focusing your mind. Right? And that starts to chip away at, the, it's a metaphor. You're cleaning it by looking. Right? Sun gazing also does it. Yeah. Right? Early morning, yeah. first hour after sunrise, first hour before sunset. Don't do it any other time. Right? Yeah. Going outside, just looking at the sun for 10, 20 seconds, then close your eyes, do your mantra, do your prayer, whatever you want to do. Right? That works. Right? The fluoride diet, right? Uh, superfoods like uh, spiruline. Kale is also very good. Kale juice is also very good. Um, you want to? I take spirulina. See, since serotonin is in the stomach, yeah. right? We want to do it in such a way that the stomach is the beginning of happiness, right? So, so you know, choose your food not as if like don't become a vegetarian. I'm not saying that, you know. I'm saying. Listen to your stomach, what digests well, what doesn't digest well. You know, Joseph Campbell, who's one of my favorite teachers of all time, used to eat steak and drink wine until he was 93, you know, and then he dropped dead happily. <laughs> you know, so it's all relative, right? It's the best way. Huh? It's, the best way. it's the only way, you know, it's all relative. It's all relative. So you've got to choose your lifestyle, right? You know, mm -hmm. So are these the only foods is what I'm asking. Do you have anything in the chemical uh, world? Like, do you have, we have supplements like vitamins and minerals. There are, Something but they're not specific. FDA or tried and tested. They're dowji. Uh, you, know, you know, there are yogis in India that give mercury and things like that. I, I, uh, you know, <laughs> let's not go there. But are there any time tested uh, reviews that we have for spirulina and all these things? That where yes, spirulina has here. been tested as a superfood yeah. and, and so has... Uh, Moringa and the C one. I can't remember the name of the C one. Obviously, my third brain is not fully active yet. I don't remember the third one. Thank you very much. Um, but I think that one of the things they found with pineal gland activation, right, is sit in darkness. That opens it up also. Okay? So shut yourself off, light a candle, and just look at the candle. In fact, one of the techniques we use is candle, right? Um, staring at the sun in early morning, right? Uh, natural ways, right, uh, the, the breathing techniques, right, these actually activate it, right, and it decalcifies just by being active, right. Um, they talk about fluoride and things like that, I don't know, you know, okay. uh, you you know if you get an Ayurvedic toothpaste, it's packed with fluoride, you know, it's bizarre, you know, and that's supposed to be natural, you know, <laughs> what is that from? Okay. Thank you so very much for this amazingly wonderful lecture. And just I wanted to ask you, sir, that there are two basic techniques of meditation. One in Gita, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna, Lord Krishna says, it, the sound should come while you breathe. So hum. While Paramas Yogananji teaches hangsa, us, hangsa. Uh, Paramas Yogananji uh, teaches us, Hunsa. Hongsa. Hongsa. So you have to, uh, uh, yani, the, uh, both the sounds come while you breathe. You can say Soham also, you can say Hunsa also. It is uh, about uh, which system is supposed to be better in your eyes. Hangsa only works if you use Kechori Mudra. Okay? If you use Kechori Mudra. You know what Kechori Mudra is? Okay, Kechori Mudra is when you put the tongue in the back of the head and you push it back. Right? You're creating a circuit between inners and Mudra in the tongue. Right? See, there are three, there are many nadis in the upper mouth, right? There are many nadis in the upper mouth, right? Hangsa, right, becomes sahang later. It becomes sahang, right? So hum becomes hamsa later, right? Because hamsa is the, the swan upon which Brahma sits, right? It separates milk from water. You become that being, right? So both are the same. One is a breathing technique. Hong Sa is a breathing technique where you suck the diaphragm in. <laughs> sa. Okay? That's what it means. And that's a Kriya breathing technique from Yogananda and Babaji. Okay? So, Hong Sa is the technique of breathing. <laughs> sa. 
you know, like that. Right? And it actually creates a current from your muladhar to your soma nadi. And it just is at the tip of your mouth, soma nadi. Then you go back and you do kechori, which you push the tongue right back, and that is the real kriya breath. You have to learn that. That's a beautiful breath. So that's the technical answer. Soham comes from the popularized with the yogic and Vedantic schools. Okay, less tantric. Right? Soham is, you know, actually it is both are Shreem and Reem in Tantra. So we say, Aim, Shreem, Reem. Right? These Shreem and Reem are so and hum. All. all. So Hangsa, Hangsa, right, is a pressured breathing of the diaphragm. <laughs> Like that. Okay. And I learned it from the Yogananda people. My God, it's hard at first. You, you, you start sweating, you get all kinds of things. <laughs> oh, well, and, huh? It is again continuation of one of the last questions, S.S. Bhakri. Will you further elucidate about the evolution of consciousness? You did dwell on consciousness as such, but on the evolution of consciousness, and secondly, in your reckoning, do you think imagination is more important than knowledge? <laughs> when you're talking about the evolution of consciousness, you're talking about the thinking of Sri Aurobindo, I believe. Is well, that correct? It's also part. <laughs> yes, but the, I think the Sri Aurobindo's belief was that we are at a state of consciousness where humanity as a whole could be at a tipping point, right? And you have Western teachers who also believe this and have carried that idea forward, Ken Wilbur and others. And evolution of consciousness is a tough one because it is saying that are we as a collective species <coughs> evolving psychically, right? From what I see with all the chaos around the world, there's no sign of that. <laughs> you know, it's difficult to, to see. We see conscious living increasing. So people are becoming more environmentally aware. People are becoming more meditating. People are doing more conscious business. People are doing, trying to do conscious things, right? But if evol evolving consciousness is an evolutionary consciousness, is a psychic phenomena, right? That Aurobindo first put forward, Dusha Dan also talked about it. You know, this is something I, you know, I run a group called Evolving Consciousness on LinkedIn. We've got about 20,000 members and it's a dialogue about mind. It's a dialogue about where the human mind is going. Come and join us. <laughs> and for your second question, see today I spoke about my research into knowledge, right? But if I didn't have the imagination to even have this desire, right, I wouldn't go there, right? I wouldn't be there. So imagination is the trigger that leads to a, I am a creative person. So for me, imagination drives the pursuit of knowledge. Yes. I think it's subjective, up to you. If you're an accountant, you will always approach it a different way. If you're a physicist, you'll approach it a different way, you know? <laughs> So two questions, if I may. Yeah. Um, so you talked about tools to activate the pineal gland and watching the rising sun was one of the ones you mentioned. Foods, nutrition. Um, you didn't talk about the breath, how, how it activates the hypothalamus. Is the hypothalamus in the limbic brain, the reptilian brain? They say, to make the breath voluntary from involuntary will eventually end up activating the part of the brain that doesn't hold emotions and anger and all of the other stuff that we collect with perception. So would you say the breath would eventually activate the pineal gland and you don't, didn't mention it at all? Breath is the critical component. Absolute critical. So what is the hypothalamus connection but with the pineal You know what I did about the hangsa? Yes, I understand. That's a breath. Mantra right? is also No, it's a breath. Tool. That is a breath, right? Correct. Um, what is the connection of hypothalamus with the pineal? Hypothalamus is the bridge between the limbic and the neocortex. I see. Okay, so it connects the emotional mind with the thinking brain, right? So you want to get out of the cortex into the hypothalamus. Cortex, into the limbic and then out of the limbic into watching, right? right? That's what you need to do, right? The hypothalamus is the entire region. Okay, this entire region, right, where 
the pineal, the, the thalamus, the pituitary, the limbic, all yes. sit, is called yes. the hypothalamus. Yes. You have a thing called the palatal lobe just above, right? You want to create a connection with the palatal lobe. That's yes. where you get the most impact, right? But that's just, that's, you can visualize the brain in different ways. But what they found over and over again is that deep breathing, learning to breathe from the diaphragm, Correct. learning to breathe from muladhar up, right, to up and down, up and down create circuit, is the most steady and sure and slow way of opening and closing and, and opening further and further and further, right? So breath is absolutely critical. So what's the connection of the vagus nerve with the hypothalamus, that nexus? I'm not sure. What is clear from science is the connection between the pineal and the sex organs, right? Very clear. But the relationship between the hypothalamus and the diaphragm, I'm not clear about. Okay. And I've not seen any research in that currently, but I'll look into it further and we'll come back to it. Take my email and I'll, I'll come I back will. to you. Yes. And the second question is about the Kailash Mansarovar and the connection between the latitudinal alignment of the longitudinal, Kailash, yeah. uh, longitudinal sorry, with Sri Lanka. And what, according to you, your version of the um, legacy and the, 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 the thought behind Mount Kailash? Graham Hancock wrote a book about 20 years ago called Fingerprints of the Gods, where he proposed the thesis that around 10,500 BC, there seems to have been, before the last ice age, uh, advanced civilization on Earth that was connected through energy energy places, right? And he has now released a new book showing new research into this, which is even more exciting now. Uh, it's called uh, Magician of the Gods, right? The new book. And it's a very powerful, interesting thesis. He says that whether you go to Mexico or Indonesia or uh, India, Mansura, Kailash, or England or different places, you see these power energy grids and energy systems that are ley lines and are structures that seem to connect the whole world together in some kind of ancient knowledge, right? So his thesis is that there was an ancient knowledge that connected all of us together in some way. It may have been information, it may have been technology, it may have been, we don't know, I don't want to go into the alien territory, but it was definitely something, in his thesis is advanced. They found artifacts of the Gulf of Cambay, of Japan, of Bali, that show all these amazing structures under the water, right? So, I think that what we're dealing with here with Mansarovar and with Sri Lanka and with Mecca, and those energy places, is that there was a sacred geography at some point that connected the whole world together, or this part of the world together. And people went on pilgrimages, people went on energy journeys that went from place to place, and seekers went further, and this was a known geography. Now, how on earth they got the longitude exactly correct, wow, I don't know. You know. You know, somebody must have drawn some seriously good geographic lines there to find that. So that's still being a mystery to look into. I'm very excited by that. Yeah, hi Raja. Uh, this is Jeevan. Hello Jeevan. And uh, see, my question is, you know, there was a lot of history and biology here. Now, uh, let's say my third eye is open now. So what is the application like? <laughs> what, is, what is the advantage? My yeah. eyes open, yeah. and you know, I am. I've got my life's goals to achieve. I am chasing my life goals, and everything is moving so fine. So, what is the application? What do I do? So, I need to understand. You know, uh, and you know, why should I do it? Okay, so I, tell, I tell you what. I tell you what. I tell you what. That's a very good question. Here's my answer. If you awaken your third eye, you will never be the same again. <laughs> so, which means what like? Which means that, imagine, okay, imagine, okay? Imagine the greatest potential you can imagine of your mind. What does it look like? Superconsciousness. What is superconsciousness? See, the experiment, what they are doing at Pondicherry, Pondicherry. Yes. Horribly. Yeah. They are trying Big to, fans. They are trying to bring the super consciousness to earth. And into every uh, atom, into every molecule. Everybody's consciousness to merge with super consciousness. Right. I would like you to elucidate on that. <laughs> Tell us more about that. 
So, but no, but let's answer the question. Yeah. Imagine the best state you can imagine your mind expanding to, consciousness going to. What would it look like? Imagine. Just, just nothing. Just nothing. Just, nothing. just nothing. being. Being. Just being. A happy state. You'd be happy all the time. You wouldn't have any worries. Right? You'd be kind. Compassionate. What, what would you be? Sir, first when you met me outside, you were always smiling, laughing. You introduced yourself. You see, that is the best stage. Your spirit. That's it. <laughs> See, the thing is that when you move in, the, like I, I, I did martial arts for a very long time, right? Aikido. And at first it was so hard. I wanted to quit, you know, knee hurting, pain, come back from exercise three times a week, beaten up, hated it. Right? Then I got better and I got better. And suddenly I was able to sit still in meditation for half an hour. I was able to do my job, my work better. I was able to suddenly be more productive. I didn't know why, right? I don't know why. So what did I get? That, that means that the, the journey of doing the martial arts led to a better version of me than I was before, right? In some way. I, version 2.0, a little bit improved, slightly improved. Now, the idea of superconsciousness, the idea of any kind of consciousness, is that sitting here, am I aware of how you feel? You know, are you and I connected heart to heart? You know, if you don't think about that, it's not going to connect. I feel it, but by me and him connecting, you are feeling it. So, you become a magician of energy and consciousness and mind. So, and they, once you become a magician, how can you go back to being a mere mortal anymore? So, so the, to answer your question, I'll just answer your question, right? That you do it because you have no idea of the human potential you're tapping into in yourself when you try. And when you expand that human potential, right, everything in life becomes better. So, uh, Is that an answer? So in practical sense, would it increase the productivity of what I am doing? In practical sense, you would probably quit your job. <laughs> and you would probably become a conscious businessman. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> you say, I don't want to be a coach anymore. I want to do conscious agriculture. <laughs> I'm off. <laughs> right? <Perfect. laughs> Hello, what's your name? I'm Vasundhara. Okay. I've been practicing heart meditation for a couple of Heart years. meditation. Tell us what that is. Tell us about it. It's about feeling the heart, uh, being mm. in love with everything. It's not uh, that I've perfected it. I'm on my journey, very initial journey. Is this from a, like a Buddhist idea of the Heart Sutra and that or? So it's Padma Jaya ah. by the Guru. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I did it in, in Indonesia. So, um, so my question to you is, circumstances have brought me here um, and as this lady, the first lady questioning you was that being in the world around, it's very difficult to, of course, you know, be in that state, even if you're meditating and, you know, it's just that my question to you is very basic. I understood the... I tried to understand the anatomy, everything, you know, you asked me. But I was just, you know, I was just taking it as, you know, coming from the Lord. But I don't know how to take it forward from here. I, I want to know who's the guru I should follow. I hear a lot about Sadhguru. I hear a lot about Yogananda. I hear several gurus. But I don't know who can actually make me learn more about opening the heart. So being the anti-guru person that I am, you're asking the wrong person about guru. No, because you, but I understand what you're saying. I so understand. Actually, I understand, I get what you're saying. Completely. The thing is, what I understood from what you're saying is in deep meditation, when you go on and on and on, you can reach a state like, you know, being in optimal, uh, you know, of your own self. Uh, the best of you. 
you know, I understood that. But it's, it's not easy without a guru, a right guru. No, it's, a, it's, it's actually a little different. It's a state of mind, you know. Because when your heart is active, right, are you not the sweetest, gentlest person possible? Are you not compassionate and kind and nobody gets an angry word out of you, you know? But maybe an hour later you kick them in the butt, but during that hour you're like bliss, you know? You feel heart, you're giving your heart, right? Yes. And you want to have, it would be nice if you could cultivate that 24 hours a day, right? That state. Yes? So, do you need a guru to get to that state? Or do you know how to get there now that you've taken the training in Indonesia and come back? So, um, according to what I have heard is, uh, you get attuned to a certain course. Um, See, a guru in India, the tradition is Shaktipat, which is, like right now, he and I are vibrating together, right? Our hearts are, I'm still vibrating, I can feel it, right? Yeah? You and I are vibrating. Because you felt it there. Somebody else is feeling it here, right? This is Shakti Path. Yeah. Okay? If I really sat here and did a Lakshmi mantra for all of you, you'd all go into Shakti Path. Little bit. You taste it, right? Shakti Path is. You're an NLP man, right? You know how to bring <laughs> the whole audience into a trance state. With 15 minutes, we're all feeling very good about our lives, right? I could do hypnoth hypnotherapy and do it for you. Right? In fact, 99% of Guru Shakti Path is hypnotism. It's a form of hypnotism. Right? If you watch when I talk, right, I say things like, imagine, picture this, right? come with me on a journey. These are all hypnotic trance words. Right? I'm not doing it purposely, but I know that as a speaker, I could bring you with me. Right? When that guru starts vibrating at a particular frequency and the music is playing, he has already made you agree at the beginning of the talk that you and him will go into some kind of resonance together. Right? So you are tuned already with him. You are already open to the tuning. Right? But the practice you do at home when you do your heart meditation, that's you being your own guru. That's you practicing, that you work. You know, in, in Western esoteric so, wisdom, they call it the work. So why is it that they give levels to these meditations, as in like, you know, there is a level to that level, and then you go for retreats above that level? Because how else, will you, how else will you buy their books or their courses, yeah? But why, why, does, why does somebody do, have to do it when somebody is so aligned with the universe? Well, why does somebody that's the, question, need to do that's the like real this? question you have to ask yourself is that if you are so bloody aligned, why are you doing this? You know, I think that the practice is the work. Okay? Every teacher, me, Guruji, whatever ji, Raja ji, blah blah ji, right? They can give you little lessons, little tools, little ways, right? Take it, learn it, see if you like it, throw it away, <laughs> you know, get lost, you know? But practice, if without the practice, without that, I get up every morning at 6.15, I go to the sun, I look at it. I now do, the, the vision is about 6 minutes and I sit there for about 15-20 minutes. It is a practice, you choose to do it. If that is a learning, I have learned from somebody, right? So I do it, because it, it, it showed me that I actually do not, I actually my power is going down now, as a result of doing it. I'm, I'm watching myself, I'm observing myself, you know. I don't want to talk about it yet because I haven't gone three months with it. When I've done three months, I'll come and tell you all about it. All right? right now, I am the living guinea pig of my own ideas. <laughs> Does that make sense? You know? So what I want you to do is I want you to be the living workshop for your ideas. Right? And sort the gurus. If your guru is willing to meet you and give you a class in two days and give you all the mantra, mantra, whatever, fine. If he says, no, 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 you'll have to go through this person, then this person, then this person, then come and meet me later, then I'll sit you in a private room and I'll do Shaktipat on your head, right? <laughs> Tell them to get lost. You know? <laughs> Sorry, no offense to anybody who was a guru. Did anybody like to share their own experiences and, and, and talk about their own experience of third eye? Anybody like to talk about that? 
Yeah, I would like to share a small experience Please. of mine. So every time I would close my eyes, I would see an orange light over here. And over the years, I saw a tunnel and a light, not knowing what it mean, meant back then or now. And then lately, it started turning into different colors and different things. And I would feel a pain over here. And automatically, it was not that I was not aware of it, but I was aware of it. My hands started moving up. And they would move in different directions. Now, I have no understanding of what it means. And um, I don't trust people easily. So to find the right guru and to be able to tell him what I'm feeling is not something which will come very comfortable to me, you know, very easily to me. But it's a good experience. It's beautiful. I'm not in a hurry to reach somewhere. I'm not, you know. You know Does it happen every day for you, this orange glow? Every time I meditate. Every time I close How my eyes. How often do you meditate? See, I didn't even know this is called meditation. Okay. I used to you just, just used to sit and look. I grew up in a joint family, so whenever I would get my time, I would lie down in a dark room and close my eyes, and I would see this, I still see this over here, an orange light. And it changes. Right know. in front or above? Some, right now it's right in front. Sometimes it's... Like right here? Right here. Like an orb or a glow? A glow. It changes, right? Sometimes it Wobbles. looks like an eye, sometimes it looks okay. like a tunnel which I'm going in, there's an orange light towards the end of it. It keeps changing. Nice. Now, I, I have an understanding of what it feels, but I have no understanding of what it means, you know. So if you could just help me understand this a little, or if you could just tell me to connect with someone who could help me understand this better. Traditionally, yeah. the color of the agya, the third eye, is indigo. Okay? It's indigo. Right? No, no, hang on. Sorry, go on. Say it. I see that, you know, that kind of light when I was doing my gymming and all, after strenuous workout, I see that light pink, then indigo, and like dancing in front of me. See? So what is that? Okay, there, there are two ways to look at it. One is that, can I generate it with intention? Right? So I'm sitting here, I close my eyes, I lift my mind up and it comes for me, right? The, the thing to remember is that what I do is I use a candle, right? Because I want to focus my mind so that it stops wavering, right? And if you stare at a candle, Ramana Maharishi taught this and others have taught this also. If you stare at a candle, right, which is orange by the way, you stare at it and then you close your eyes and you see the orange flame in your head, in your head and you watch it right? just with your eyes closed you see it watch it 30 seconds you watch close your eyes look it you will be able to start after within a few times you'll be able to watch it and move it okay and you see a small flame in your own head right? which is orange with a glow right? when you do that right you will watch yourself it'll either drift down to your heart or it'll up to your head Okay, you want it to go either way, it's fine. Because right in front of you is not where you, you, you want to move it up or down. You want to see if you can move it, right? Can I move it into my spine? Can I move it into my heart? But why do you want to? I'll tell you why. Because if this is Kundalini awakening, right? That means one of your chakras is active while the rest are not. Okay, now here's how it happens to some people. Some people will suddenly find themselves exploding in the heart, right? They have no idea. Who has felt heart explosions? You felt it? Where it just like electrical ripples coming out of your heart, right? If you listen to the sound of that, the, the yogic word is madhyama, right? Have you heard of madhyama? You've heard of madhyama? Okay. The, the, it also means that sometimes the lower chakras are not balanced. Okay. Because if you have a sudden moment, that means that it's not equally balanced. Like I've had huge madhyama and huge head, right? Huge, right? But I'd fall ill, I would have stomach problems, I would go, you know, work problems, emotional sometimes problems, right? So I had to start working on my lower parts, right? And that helped a lot, right? That was by doing simple things like hatha yoga or Qigong or physical exercise or playing tennis, it actually gets you down to your earth, right? So balancing is a very critical thing. But regarding permanently seeing an orange glow, I don't want to tell you to go get medical help because you might want to do that, right? 
because that sh that you should get it checked out because it yeah, could sure. be a form of glaucoma and stuff like that. I hope so. And but I think we need to check this out. And I will, you know, we'll talk to some people. You see, I've spent about 22 years doing this haphazardly at first, and then actively, and then seriously, right? And I don't. I have two issues. I don't necessarily believe in God, right? And I'm sorry. Don't. Don't make, get me wrong when I say this. I don't believe in a God. You know, this kind of Easter devata was going to come and save my ass. Excuse my language. Right? I don't know. I don't know about that. Right? Uh, I do know that I have seen my own mental neural capacities expand. Right? And I've enjoyed that. Right? And I've learned from great teachers. And I've learned from different schools. Um, so what I've done is that where we did a session on awakening the third eye comfortably, slowly, easily, right? Using breath, using heat, using geometry, body, coming up, rising, and then how to hold it, right? And then using it again and again, and sound, right? And I combine what I've learned from mostly from Sri Vidya and Kriya. And I combine those together right? in, my, in my way. So if you want to learn that, you're welcome to come and join us, right? And I promise you this, I can't guarantee you a permanent orange light in front of your head, but I can give you, I'll give you, you will have an experience of some kind of vision of it, right? Sorry, may I ask a question? What's your name? Deepika. Deepika. So thank you very much for the talk. I really, really enjoyed it. It was intellectually stimulating and very exciting. Um, my, so my question is this. I think that most people who are in any uh, sort of spiritual practice usually come to it with the goal of attaining happiness and enlightenment and hopefully you revolutionize your own life and the lives of those around you. So um, for instance, you have talked a lot about meditation uh, and you've talked about the pineal gland and you know you use a certain uh, vocabulary when you talk about your spiritual revolution. There are many spiritual practices that talk about it in totally different terms. For instance, I practice Nichiren Buddhism, I chant, I've had experiences. The one thing that I do know is you have to have a lot of discipline and consistency. Consistency is really important if you want to see results in anything. Um, and, and my question is, because what I have experienced is I think the more you ascend, the more you can ascend. And you know, you've talked about this explosion through your crown chakra, and you've talked about opening the third eye. Is that an actual destination? Because how would you know, you know? Or, or is it just different for everyone? And is it just more about the process of getting there? Or is that an actual place? So that's, sorry, that's the first part of my question. And the second question is, do you think that there is some spiritual practice which is, or, or some spiritual practices which are superior to others in terms of activating your third eye? Well, I mean, on the last question, I don't know about superior, but for example, Tibetan Buddhism is much more third eye oriented than Zen or chanting or any of those other schools, right? So the, the, the Dalai Lama and his schools are much more inclined towards Tantra. Right? They come from the Nagarjuna school of Nalanda. So it's very tantric. Right? Their whole school is tantric, which is very different from a Buddhism from Thich Nhat Hanh or, or any of the other teachers from Zen or any of the chanters or any of them. Right? So, but the destination, I think that, that it is an endless journey. Right? Because if you saw infinity, would you know? You know? Would you know the infinite if you saw it? You catch a glimpse of it and you go, wow, I've seen it. But you haven't really. You've caught a little, little morsel of it, right? Like, for example, I went into a church. I was in Mauritius and I went into a church. And they told me that the Mother Mary there was very powerful, right? So I had no idea. Right? And I'd been meditating anyway. And I went in there and I suddenly found myself crying. And I didn't know why. Right? My heart just exploded. And tears came down my eyes. I was just in, it was, I didn't, it, was it her? 
Was it the place? Was it some saint who had stood there and given energy there? Was it just me hypnotizing myself into a trance state? Right? I don't know. Right? But it was a marker on my experience that said, my God, you know, this is beautiful. Right? So I think that there's a term in English called accidental tourist. I'm perpetually an accidental tourist. You're perpetually in the spiritual game. You have no idea, you know. That the mystical game is harder. If somebody tells you, look, one, two, three, four, five, you'll get this experience and, and come. We'll all go there together and see the orb. And the orb is God. And that's it. Worship now. That's, that's, icon, that's an icon. You're creating a new God. You're creating a new book. You're creating a new way, right? Ah, I'm an iconoclast. You know, shatter everything. You know? So I would say, great. Continue the chanting. Do it. But don't seek a destination. You know? Keep opening it up. See how your brain goes. See how your mind goes. See how your heart goes. Are you a better person by doing chanting? Are you more charitable? Are you more philanthropic? Do you care more? You know, are you kinder with your words? Or do you still say horrible things to your mother? Right? <laughs> Still happens. <laughs> but it's better than before. <laughs> but I don't see any orange lights or indigo colors or visions or anything like that. Yeah, that could be a thyroid problem. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. But seriously, I think that colors are indications of active chakras, okay? So whatever color you're seeing, it's a chakra part of your system is telling you something, right? So if you, like for example, you know, I didn't have a childhood where I saw white light in my sleep or anything like that. I had to cultivate it by doing heavy Kriya Yoga, right? And heavy Kundalini systems, right? You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a product of experimentation rather than gifts of God, right? And today, I could see lights, I could see colors, I could see different things, right? Um, but when I'm ill, a different color will come. When my stomach is upset, a different color comes, you know. So it tells you. So I think that you have to decipher the code and you have to get help on the advice on what the code means. But, but it's a code. It's a code. The color is orange, yes, but it, uh, I see a lot more. I'll probably take it offline sometime, yeah. According to the system, where are we? Muladhara is red. So you're... Your, 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 your whole Swadhisthana is very active, right? So that could be a sign of something to come, right? It could be an unblocked, something that has to be unblocked in the Swadhisthana, right? So you have to look at that carefully, right? And circulate the energy down and see what happens, right? right? So for example, just by using the beej bang, right, you might be able to find out what it means, right? Um, bang, each one has a sound, right? Each one has a sound. So like for example, if we're dealing with hara, right? You know Buddhist chanting, right? The hara is these two, right? So when we say Om Mani Padme Ho, right? We're doing these two, right? We're opening the heart, right? So when you go to a Buddhist monastery or you go to a chanting and you hear this term, your heart just explodes, you don't know why. It's a psychosomatic thing that just happens. You don't know what's going on, right? It happens. You know, you go into a Dalai Lama teaching and they're playing Om Mani Padme Ho and you're like, ah, you know, teach me, Lord. You know, like, you know, give it to me, you know. And it works every time. So I think that, that the science of sound and correlation to psychology and this is very interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. There's a whole school called Nada Yoga of that. So I'm looking at that also. I just wanted to know that uh, being intuitive, like, uh, uh, if I think about someone, uh, within few minutes, the person calls me. A few um, years ago, uh, I was sitting in a balcony of my house, and uh, there was one chirping bird came with, uh, there was a, you know, the, uh, some kind of uh, knot in her legs. Oh. She was, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, there was a telephone or cable or going in front of that. She was chirping there. So I was reading newspaper, so I saw her. So she was uh, repeatedly pulling her leg, you know, 
like she was lifting and keeping like this. So, uh, this uh, kind of vibration came in my mind, a thought that uh, she has some pain in the leg mm. and uh, I must release that uh, dhaga, the thread she was knotted, you know. So, but when I went to catch her, she just made the difference and she flew away, you know. So, I thought that is after few minutes, she again came, you know. And then I uh, again, it, uh, the thought came in my mind that Chidiya, jab tak tum mere paas nahi aoghi, mein kaise tumhara dhaga ko kaat sakta hu. And another thought came in my mind because I was using the razor, twin's blade. I was not using the blade in my, so there was no blade, you know. Ki jab tak mere paas blade nahi hoga, mein tumhare dhaga ko kaise kaatunga. Hmm. I don't know, she again flew and after five minutes she came with a blade. Uh, she no. Uh, so yeah, she dropped on my newspaper you know, and she was sitting there. <laughs> and uh, I just successfully, uh, you know, uske dhaga ko maine blade se kaata. Hata diya apne. So there are many varieties of this kind of incidents are happening. So just I wanted to know what is this symbol? The universe is talking to you, my friend. Listen. <laughs> what do you do? Uh, I'm a broadcast channel. I make documentary films. So you're a creative person. Yeah. I also make films, by the way. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so these blessings, one should never underestimate the power of energy flowing in your system, right? I think that your energy work, you need to work on your energy because you're a natural healer, your natural gift is that and if, you, if I had that gift, I would go and find everything from energy healing to Qigong, I would find out about my energy, what I am, what I can do with it, how to channel it, I would learn everything I could, right? And don't underestimate the power of your gift you have to heal, right? First of all, psychic communication with a bird, that's imagination, but it's beautiful. That means that the bird is responding to your lack of fear or danger, right, by helping you. But the, the, the dhaga and all, I'm, I don't get that. That's amazing, right? But if you've got this energy, and do good in the world, go, you know. Look, I think that there is more to this universe than any of us can ever explore in our whole lives, right? And whether you go through to science or whether you go through spirituality or whether you go through both or whether you go through psychology or whether you go through doing good in the world or whatever, right? You've got to figure out your own journey on this, right? And all people can do is help you with your own journey. It is your own journey, right? This is what I keep saying over and over again. No guru is going to save you. You're going to do it yourself. That's the only way. That's the only way. But learn. Suck up everything you can from everybody you can. Grab that woman and learn everything you can. You know? <laughs> Download. <laughs> you know? <laughs>